Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it is, it is uh, you know, we have a conference that's called No Panels, and then say, Dave, would you do the one and only keynote? Well, that sounds completely terrible. I really, just, I really don't want to do that. Um, so, I, so I was trying to think, but you know, I, I, uh, I started this conference, it's called The Lobby. And the idea behind The Lobby is that I was going to all of these conferences, and I never wanted to come in, I never wanted to leave the lobby because you'd walk in and you'd have someone like me standing up there pontificating and be like, oh my God, seriously, that, you know, maybe you'll say one interesting thing over the course of an hour, whereas I could be sitting out chatting with people and have seven interesting conversations in the time, time frame that it, it, made, it took you to have one joke and one like minor revelation or something. So, uh, so as a result, I should, of course, never, ever stand in front of a bunch of people because it's, uh, it's completely contradictory to what I think makes any sense. So you should all leave immediately. <laughs> Go have breakfast out there. All right, I don't that. See? Good. Dutifully, dutifully followed. Um, but, you know, that said, I, uh, I, I was uh, certainly happy to try and come up with something that would be, uh, be useful and and I thought the best way to get to that was to make the keynote about whatever you all want it to be about. Um, so, so I have nothing prepared whatsoever. I figure we just find out here what we're what we're going to talk about. Uh, so I figure we got some topics. Um, we got some companies, and um, uh, we have some random shit. Uh, that's like. Um, this is the like wild card category that makes my life hard. When you say, gee, I'd really like to talk about cats or whatever, and I go, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Um, and by the way, I'm dyslexic, so if I misspell things, it's because I'm dyslexic. That's all. Um, uh, so far, I think I'm doing OK. So what do you want to, so what do you want to talk about this Current morning? State What's that? Current state of Current investment. Current state of investment here. That is like the easiest softball. Like Current state of investment. <laughs> I could talk about that for two hours. Uh, Current state of investment. Okay, what else? What industries or types of companies really get you excited or what you want to see come across your desk? What exciting? <laughs> Ideally, a com company-wide. How the lack of exits and liquidity is reshaping um, investment strategies. And uh, lack of exits sucks. <laughs> new, uh, new funding strategies coming on board like crowdfunding. Crowd funding. End of VCs. <laughs> Co-founder bringing in a new CEO. Uh, new CEO. Cats. Cats? No, come on. Okay, we got something better, something more random than that. That's easy. That's like a. How to choose your board members? Board. Okay. Yeah. So how to assess people? Uh, Choosing. Any companies that are of interest that I uh, re relay rides? I want to see why you're excited about them and what you think for them in the future. Relay rides, awesome! You get I get to pimp my own company. That's <laughs> what would it use? Everybody's all positive about what would you invest in, etc. What would you absolutely not want to see? Don't. Okay. Where's your next vacation? Vacation. I just returned. I just had too long of a vacation. I know. Thank you. I like it. How about the first, the whole controversy about personal data? Who owns the data? data? Who has rights to it? Data. Data. Personal privacy. Data. Okay. There's no chance I'm, that I'm gonna now say anything coherent. So what do we got? Investment, what's exciting, lack of exits, crowdfunding, the new, bring on a new CEO, boards, how do you choose people, privacy and data, we'll put this over here in like cat companies or something. What don't I like? Good question. Where should I go on vacation? Where should we go on vacation? All right, all right, all right. Um, 
Anything else? Chromecast in the future of TV. Say that? Chromecast in the future of TV. Chromecast in the future of TV. All right, so it sounds like people are mo are largely interested in um, in the venture business, which is always amazing to me because the venture business is so boring. Um, in fact, when I, uh, you know how you get a survey you, and it starts, first it asks you, are you male or female? And then it asks you, what's your age range? I'm deeply saddened to say I'm now sort of in that like last age range, which is funny. <laughs> So there are all sorts of disappointments I have in, when I fill out a survey. That's the first one, and say, uh, oh, I'm in the like, old age range. Usually they then disregard your survey, by the way. <laughs> and then it asks, what's your industry, right? And you have to go through the, in what's your industry? And it says, like, are you in this or that or whatever? And I have to choose financial services, <laughs> which is horrible, right? I mean, think about it. How many people in this room would be excited to write, finan to click financial services in a thing? It, it's, you would. I mean, it makes me sad every time I have to do it because I think that the venture business is like the least financial services related business on the planet, right? And people who think that it is ultimately a financial services business are, in, by and large, terrible, terrible venture investors. They, they really are. And it turns out that, um, you know, if you look this the question of, you know, how do you choose a new CEO and that and that and that business? How do you you know how do you find who are the right people to build a business? How do you you know how do you think about the building of companies? That's really, as far as I'm concerned, what venture investors do. Um, <coughs> and that that financial piece is the the least interesting and and in many ways the least impactful piece of what I do in any given um, in any given year. And um, it, it, and, and yet, in reality, my job is to take someone's money and invest it in things that hopefully turn that money into more money and return more money than they gave me, and they say thank you, and I get paid a piece of it, and everybody's happy, right? That's, if you had to, if you had to, that's the venture business, right? That's all it is, and, and so oftentimes people say, well, what is the, you know, who is the client of the venture capitalist? And the client of the venture capitalist, technically speaking, is my limited partner. My limited partner is the person who's investing in my fund. We just raised a new fund uh, about a year ago. Um, $350 million fund uh, to, to invest in kind of early stage companies, or sorry, $300 million fund in early stage companies and a $250 million fund to invest in whatever we want. It's, it's sort of it, I mean. Now, keep in mind that it's sort of whatever you want, except that if you make bad choices, that you'll never get one of those funds again. So it's not really whatever you want, because we could. We could literally take that $250 million and invest it in uh, Bitcoin. Just buy Bitcoin, $250 million worth of Bitcoin, and say, we have, and, th and then we would have to then say to our LPs in, in, in our quarterly notice, we have invested $250 million of, in Bitcoin. <laughs> And in about three seconds, we would get the phones would ring off the hook. Like, you're what are you an idiot? You know, like. And if it went up, they would still think we were idiots, and we'd never raise another fund. Because really, what they're looking for at the end of the day is for us to be uh, buying what I think of as technology futures, right? What you know, at the end of the day, you can buy <coughs> corn futures, you can buy oil futures. They're all about predictions about what will happen in these industries in the future. Are is there going to be more value to you know per pound for corn, corn or whatever? We in the end are looking for those the 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 future of technology in this very very small sliver of the universe that that exists disproportionately here in Silicon Valley. In some ways, it may be like mining. It may be that at the end of the day, it's like you know showing up and you're in at a diamond mine and you you know you dig and dig and dig and hopefully you find the big diamond. Um, the only problem is that in the intervening process, it's all about the people, right? It's you know you may or, you you may have found the diamond, but every so often those diamonds then you know uh, disintegrate and you go what I had a diamond <laughs> and sometimes. You know, you're digging and and you think it's a diamond. It turns out it look it looks like cubic zirconium, and you're like, oh my god, what was I thinking? I owe you twenty million dollars worth of cubic zirconium. It's totally worth. It's worth like forty bucks. And then 
over time, it transforms somehow into this incredibly, incredible, precious, precious gem, uh, and and, uh, and and you succeed. So, it's a tricky, tricky business, and it's and it uh, and it's and I say it's tricky for venture investors, but it's way trickier for you guys because I get to bet on ten companies and and see how it transforms, and you get to bet on one, right? You get to you get to um, to to make a single choice and then see how it goes. So, so far have I covered anything? No. So far, so far I've got nothing taken care of. <laughs> What's exciting? Nope. Lack of exits? No. Nope. We got nothing. Uh, how much more time do I have? I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll cover it in the next 20 minutes. Um, so, so as I as I watch the venture business and I watch it transform and I watch and I've watched I've been now at August Capital for 13 years. Uh, I have been an attorney before joining August. Uh, I represented all sorts of interesting companies in the late 90s, and that get, get, got me luckily into the venture business, where they said, "Hey, David, we like you. Lawyers usually suck at this job, but but we think you might be able to do it. So if you're willing to take a risk, then." Come, come see what you see, and we'll see how it goes. Why do lawyers suck at the job? Why do lawyers? Well, so I, I, I obviously <coughs> have a little bit of issue with that. I've been an attorney and now I'm not. But the, but the argument at the time was that that there are principals and there are agents, right? And that entrepreneurs, you guys are principals. Your your job is to make a set of decisions. You go, okay. I have an idea, I'm gonna pursue it, I'm gonna raise money, I'm gonna raise money from this person, not this person, I'm gonna sell my company, I'm not. You're in the business of making decisions. And then there are a set of people who are in the business of being agents, of doing, of, in, of acting upon other people's decisions, right? And lawyers are among those people. Lawyers, lawyers and accountants and, and consultants are, they, they recommend choices, but they very rarely are in charge of making choices. They're about saying, here are a range of opportunities and you should think about it, whatever. Now, one of the reasons that, my, that they, I was ultimately asked to join the venture business is that I was very bad at that. I was very bad at sort of going, here's some choices, what do you want to do? I was much more like, here's some choices, this is what you should do, you know? And I remember doing that once while a very senior partner in my, in my then law firm was on the phone and I heard him gasp. You know, I mean, I said, here are the choices, blah, 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 and my, very, my young client said, so what would you do, David? And you could tell, he was like, please do not answer that. Please do not answer that. Please do not answer that. I said, well, it seems pretty clear to me what you should do. You should do, you know, you should do this thing. And to which my clients, not terribly surprisingly, said, yeah, do that. You know, and the guy, and the guy was like, <gasps> you know, and we hang up the phone, and I, and I, I, I started counting. One, two, <laughs> three phone rings. Hello, you know. <laughs> What the fuck are you doing? Telling him what to do. I said, I didn't tell him what to do. I had, he asked me for advice. I gave him advice. Like, well, no, your job is to give advice, not to tell him what to do. I was like, it's a fine line, but I'm going to be a VC anyway, so whatever. Um, so, so, the, so, so the venture business is, is really about, um, is about making choices, and it's about understanding this broad range of, of, uh, of things and trying to make a set of choices that will ultimately uh, ultimately help predict success in ways that are really tricky, right? I mean, you guys, and you guys know it because as you start a business, you there's a market, you look at it and say, well, here's a, here's a market, I think there's an opportunity, there's some white space, and then the next day, Google announces something and you go, oh, really? You know, <laughs> I, I can't believe it. We had a business like this that was pursuing a particular thing and it was quite interesting, built an interesting service, and then Facebook launched it, the service. And you kind of go, wow, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty problematic for your business, right? Now, one could argue, you look at Foursquare, what, what, you know, has, Google, has, has Facebook check-ins taken all the value from Foursquare or what? You know, not necessarily, but it certainly changed the landscape, and they had to know that there was a possibility it was coming. So, so I, so when I look at things like this current state of investment, or I look at the, the question of, uh, of crowdfunding and, and, uh, and lack of exits, I think they're all part of this soup that goes into my decision-making process to try and invest in the right set of companies, to try and get in front of the right set of companies, all of those things. Um, and, and they've changed over time, right? When I joined the venture business in 2000, 
Uh, when I, the day I joined the venture business, it was all beauty and light. I mean, it was like the great, this is the greatest time, uh, I forget what the quote was, but it was something like, you know, the, the greatest create, legal creation of wealth in the history of mankind or something, you know, legal creation. Um, the 90s were unbelievable. And so it looked like whatever you put money in, you just needed relationships because you needed people to start things and you give them money and then they work and then they take them public in three days and, and they make you a ton of money. It was great, right? And so in many ways, my partners were like, David's a relationship guy, he knows a bunch of people, so great, he's well suited for this. Well, two minutes later, the entire economy collapsed. Now, I don't think it's my fault. <laughs> it might be, it might be, uh, you know. But two minutes later, my son would tell you, this is a vacation story, my son would tell you that if you want to make sure to not see the leads in a, in a Broadway show, take me with you. Because <laughs> inevitably when, we, when my, my son and I go to some Broadway show and we get to the theater, it says, you know, like, uh, playing the role of the really important person you came to see is shitty person. <laughs> you know, and you, and, and sorry, you don't get to see the famous person you came to see because that person is taking a vacation day. I inevitably am the cause of that, according to my son. We never get to see the leads. So I entered the venture business and the economy collapsed. It's totally my fault, I'll admit. So suddenly, this thing that I had joined the venture business to do was no longer there. It wasn't, how do I harvest? How do I reach out and find interesting people who I know are going to do interesting things? It was. How do you make good choices in a tough economy about what might come to fruition some number of years down the road, right? Um, and, and, and this idea, this lack of exits problem, it was 100% the problem then, right? If you had funded a company in, um, in 1999 and you hadn't already gotten it public, you weren't going to. And so if you, had, if you were building a company that was precipitated on the idea that you could get it public or that you could always raise more money or that, you, you know, that there was this infinite capital resource before you and you were building it that way, and we've seen many companies built this way, right, where it's don't worry about revenue, just worry about growth, and suddenly the pool of capital gets destroyed, you're in deep, deep trouble. And that is exactly what happened across the board. There were just a ton of companies that were suddenly trying to build for uh, what seemed a certain future and became incredibly uncertain, um, in large part because, there, because, of this, because of this lack of exits world. And, and here's what happens when there are no exits. And, um, and here's why actually we're doing, we're in great shape at the moment, and why it was really ugly from not, you know, 2000 until 2006 <coughs> at least, is that if there is no public market, you know, the, when you're building a company, the best thing that can happen to you, and some, some would argue with this, but financially speaking, the best thing that can happen to you is that you take a company public and it's successfully received by the public markets. Why? Because because they're more valuable, right? The public, these public companies now, trading at five and 10 and $40 billion, are unbelievable outcomes for the founders and the investors, et cetera. But it's really hard, right? And once you get a company public, the likelihood that it succeeds while a public company is also really hard, right? You suddenly now have to, I mean, you all are trying to build companies and you're saying, oh, I'm gonna make $40,000 this quarter, and then you make, 30,000 and who cares, right? Public company says we're gonna make 40, 40 million dollars or 400 million dollars and they make 30 million dollars and their stock price gets cut in half, right? So you live and die by your ability to perform once you're a public company, but if you perform, it is an unbelievable value and it's unbelievable outcome. You know, uh, I can't uh, these days speak to anyone without saying the word Splunk. Uh, I funded the Splunk founders in the deep heart of darkness in 2000, I think three, when there were no exits, there was no opportunity, but they were building something interesting. Three founders who said, you know, if you take a bunch of data and you build a search engine on top of it, I think you could do interesting things. And I said, yeah, that sounds great, let's, let's do that. And it turned into this company Splunk, which is essentially uh, a search engine, a platform that sits on top of machine data and allows you to do unbelievably interesting things, and as a result, they get, they've made a ton of money, 
and the company is now trading at like five billion dollars. That's amazing, but one little misstep and that value is going to get is going to drop dramatically. If they continue to grow, it's great. So, if you have an, a public company, if you have a public market available, then there's this opportunity to build multi-billion-dollar companies. The incredibly important byproduct of that is that if you have, if great companies have an alternative to being bought, then when someone wants to buy them, it costs them more, right? So suddenly if you're a company trying to acquire a great company that's going public, you have to pay more. You can't pay, might have paid $300 million for that great company, now you have to pay a billion, right? And it's because they can say no and they can say no with impunity. We had a company that, in fact, two of our companies in the last decade that when they were filing to go public got acquired by, by big companies because they're like, wait a second, the second you go public, we can't afford you anymore. We, we can't let that happen. So Google bought Postini and, and, uh, um, and Business Objects bought, uh, bought um, Crystal Decisions right as they're getting ready to go. Now, the opposite is also true. When there is a lousy public market, when there is a lousy economy, then there's no particular incentive for these companies to pay a lot of money to acquire your company. And so shy of you know, big companies competing for it, the prices all get depressed. So if you have a big public market, then not only are the public, off, public prices valuable, but the acquisition prices are valuable. And the byproduct of that is that people fund you at high prices, right? If there's some <coughs> opportunity, oh my goodness, this thing might be worth billions of dollars, then I might fund you at hundreds of millions of dollars. If it turns out that the only potential outcome for you is hundreds of millions of dollars, then I will only fund you at tens of millions right so as long as the top of the funnel is open then the venture you know venture money flows at better prices and better values all along the system and you know in many ways I would argue that this this crowdfunding business is a byproduct of this market of it well it's a byproduct of two things one this belief that there's an unbelievable uh, uh, availability of money uh, that's coming to you right it's down the path and that and and it, the VCs are getting all the value, you know. We're not. VCs are making all this money, and all the poor little guy is, is uh, isn't making any of it. Now, you know, if you if you looked at the industry, the VCs are VCs are losing all sorts of money, and the poor little guys aren't getting to lose it alongside them. So I'm not sure that that's such a bad thing. But but for a few small this small top 10% of the venture business, they are making a ton of money, and people are like, wait, what about me? Why can't I make you know a ton of money alongside? Well, and so. It's because there's this, there are massive outcomes, and then there's this incredible misunderstanding of the likelihood of success, right? I mean, you know, what is the likelihood of success in investing in, a, in, an, in an early stage startup? I, I recently saw a report, and it's not pretty. You know, the likelihood that you succeed in investing in an, in a, in an early stage startup rounds to about zero. You know, it's like, hey, how's that gonna go? You're gonna lose your money. This is how it's gonna go. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, speak, speaking more of Broadway, I've inserted Broadway for vacation. Uh, I, I invested actually in a, in a Broadway show, and when my wife said, you know, is that a good idea? I said, no, it's a terrible idea. You know, and she was like, you know, I said, it's a great way to lose our money. And she's like, I don't understand. I said, but it's super fun. Which one? Uh, I had two, Avenue Q and American Idiot. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, I did all right, but I could have lost all my money. I should have lost all my money. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, lack of exits, end of VC, crowdfunding, um, current state of it. So, so, so what's happening investing right now? What's happening investing right now is that in, from 2000, the economy crashed in 2008. Already the returns for venture investors sucked. In fact, from 2000 to 2010, if you invested a dollar in venture, you made less than a dollar out, right? So that's bad. Like, you know, one would say, gee, I don't think I'll give you money <laughs> if, you're gonna, if what you're going to do is lose it, right? And it's not nearly as fun as investing in Broadway. At least when you invest in Broadway, you get to go to opening night, you know? If you, you invest in a venture fund, it's like you get to go to an annual meeting. <laughs> it's not as fun, I can assure you. Um, so for 10 years, the venture business was lousy and people were losing money. But, and so in 2000, 2008, by 2008, particularly when the economy crashed, 
it became incredibly hard for venture investors to raise money. And so we had, we had gone from hundreds of venture firms in, uh, in the beginning of the 90s to thousands of venture firms by 2000, and we, were on, and we are now on a path back to, if not hundreds of venture firms, you know, a, a, a fraction of the number that we've gotten to, and people couldn't raise money uh, between, you know, it, from 2008 on, with a small exception, which is that there were a sliver of firms that have been able to raise funds, and they have, as a result, raised bigger funds, right? Because if, you, if you're the firm that wants to, that people want to invest in, what, they're, what, what investors are saying is, we'd love to invest, but we only want to invest in these 20 firms. Well, it turns out that's hard, right? You know, there aren't, if, there's, if there are billions of dollars that want to invest in, in dozens of firms, it's not possible. And so, in many ways, what's happened is that those dozens of firms have just gotten bigger. Right, have gotten now billion dollar fund instead of hundreds of millions of dollar funds. The other thing that's happened uh, a fair bit, and I think is an interesting shift, is that, um, and in large part driven by Andreessen Horowitz, you know, Mark, uh, Mark came in, he was an operator, he looked at the business and he said, we're gonna help you operate, we're gonna build this, this infrastructure to help our companies by building PR organizations and, 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 uh, and uh, recruiters and all these things. And so there are other firms now, well, on, you know, around Sand Hill Road that are trying to build these organizations to help you build your business. I'll tell you, my view of that is that ultimately you need to build your own business. It's nice, it's a nice to have, it's definitely not a must have. In fact, in many ways, the focus should be on how do I help you build a great business? How do you build, how do you build a business that's gonna be successful and stand alone and grow and all those things? And so your ability to do those things independent of any help I can give you is a far bigger indicator of the likelihood of success of your company than your ability to do it because I have a good recruiter for you, right? Um, so, so in the but but there is this shift and there's a shift to this kind of oper operationalization where people are saying, hey, we can help you build your business, and and I understand it, right? Because if you think about the venture business, in in many respects, what do I do? I meet with you, you tell me about your business, I say, here is here's ten million dollars. Well, guess what? Anyone who has $10 million then can give you $10 million, and it's completely fungible. $10 million is $10 million, it doesn't matter. I can tell you, my $10 million is no prettier than anyone else's $10 million. We never even see it, it gets wired. It used, used to be fun, it used to be fun, you'd write a check. <laughs> have you ever gotten a $10 million? I haven't gotten a $10 million check, but I have facilitated that, you know, where your, your company raises $10 million, you hand a check, and you're like, wow. It's like so many zeros. It's completely <laughs> awesome. Now you get an email. Confirmation that you're, you know, you have $10 million. And the most excitement you can have is then to go to your electronic banking, you know, pull it up and go, look at it, go, $10 million. You know? Which isn't bad, that's kind of cool, but it's not as cool as getting a check. No, it's money in the bank and it's cleared. That's good. It's good. I'm just saying it's good. Oh, no, you know, you've got a, if there's a $10 million check written on August Capital's bank account, it'll clear. It's not like, <laughs> I can't believe it bounced. <laughs> that would be stunning, and in this day of Twitter and social media, it would spread very quickly. <laughs> um, I have no idea where I was. <laughs> Covering all these important things. So, so anyway, so I, so I do think so. So there is the shift to sort of towards oper operationalization. There is there are fewer firms, but bigger firms, and then there is and then there are a lot more little professional little firms that are that are out there. The you know the the um, first round capitals and soft tech VCs and etc. Who didn't exist when I entered the venture business? All angels were, were were basically individuals who made a bunch of money and they put money to work. And suddenly, people like Josh Koppelman said, "I don't have enough money to fund all the things I want to. I'm going to raise funds." And so, so here's what happens. As a result, there are all these funds that are funding little companies to get started. Here's a million and a half dollars. Let's figure out if it works. Well, what's supposed to happen is then you put this money to work. You work hard. You try and figure out if it works. If you make progress, then you go to the venture investors and you say, okay, I've made some progress, here it is, now give me $6 million, whatever. Because there is a, a, a larger number of these professional angels available, there are a larger number of these early stage ventures getting started, I don't think that they're any less likely 
proportionally to be successful, but at the end of the day, there are more of them, and always it's been the case that more companies fail than succeed. And so the byproduct is there are a lot more companies that are out trying to raise money that never will. And so there's this sort of sense of uh, doom, like this, you know, the, the Series A crunch. There is no Series A crunch, it was the same, you know, the same crunch we've always had, which is most people don't get Series A. It's sort of the same reason I uh, uh, just did a video interview and, and the question is, you know, I, uh, was it sort of about VC hating? And, and there's all this VC hating and I, tot and I said I totally get it because my job is to say no. My job, I mean, I would love it if my so job was more to say yes, but frankly, my job is 998 times out of 1,000, I say, I like you, I think it's interesting, blah, 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 but I'm not going to fund you, right? That's a terrible, that's a terrible job. Like that's just a, there's so many bad things about the venture business. But that's just a terrible job and, you know, and then people do a bad job of it because it's like, you don't want to say no, so then you forget to and then people are like, you're such a jerk, you didn't even say no. You just ignored me, you know. So, so anyway, we have all these early stage startups. They're trying to get venture funded. We have smaller number of venture funds that are, that are trying, that are uh, uh, available to fund them, albeit with slightly larger funds, but the result is that a lot more companies are not making, are not matriculating, and then and then you have a relatively small number of companies that would be likely acquirers. So this this there's a little bit of a myth that you can always sell your company in an aqua hire or whatever. Turns out that's not true. I've had instances where I've had very fine teams who have tried to do something interesting have not managed to do something interesting. We have proposed acquisitions that in many instances were basically here have the team in exchange for a, the, you know, a good story like we sold it. And, in the, and even then not been able to say yes, that's a, you know, we'll do that because there's a bunch of overhead or whatever. Um, so more companies funded, less funding. And then the other thing that's interesting is that by and large, because there are a set of these, let's say, couple couple dozen firms that have that that can consistently raise money, that are engaged in the conversations, oftentimes when a company is getting funded, those there are multiple of those those firms are trying to fund them, and then and then it's good news for the entrepreneur because then it's like okay, now the VCs are fighting over us. How do you know we have some leverage to say who do we want to work with? What do we think are reasonable terms, etc. So. Um, so that you know, I think that's kind of the state of funding and how you can and, and, and company building at this point. Um, so, uh, boards, people. Let's let's talk about people. I had, I, I mentioned the idea that um, that the venture business is not a financial service business. The interesting thing about the VC business when when I talk with people, first I had to talk to my mom. I talked to my mom. Because I, you know, every good Jewish boy should go to be a lawyer if he's not going to be a doctor. I wasn't going to be a doctor, so my mother was willing, begrudgingly, to accept that I was a lawyer. Um, but when I called her and said I had, I was, I passed the bar and I was a practicing attorney, and now I'm leaving to be this thing called a venture capitalist. She's like, "What is that? You know, like what is a VC?" And I tried to explain it to her, and um, and her reaction, which I think was very interesting, was, "Ah, you've talked your way into a job that only involves talking." Which I <laughs> sort of true. Thank you, mom. Thanks for the encouragement. Uh, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough, it's tough love in the Hornet house. Um, if this ends up anywhere on the web, she will find it. I, I don't mean it. Uh, but when I talk with people who are interested in the venture business, and they say, "Well, what you know, what's a good path to VC?" And I, first of all, I always say there is no really good path to VC. There isn't. But, and the really troubling part is that to be a good venture capitalist in some ways, you need to be a good technologist. You have to under te understand technology, underlying technology, and how things are moving. You need to be a futurist and kind of have a sense of what, the, what you know, all, all these trends might hold in the future. You have to be, you, know, you do have to understand finance. You, you have to be, uh, you know, an operator and understand. But you also have to be a really good people per You have to understand people. You have to have a sense of people because they may they make such a big difference. They can make great people can turn bad businesses into good businesses, and bad people can turn good businesses into bad businesses. And um, and so I always say like the best possible role, you know, 
thing you could do is to go study psychology and psychiatry or whatever, you know, understand, understanding people. And so this question of how do you find great people is such a tricky one, right? And I think that people, it's so affected by our own biases, right? We want, we want to work with people we like, and yet are people we like really the right people for our business? And, and, and the answer to a certain degree, I have to say, is yes. In the end, every company has a very clear and specific culture. And if it doesn't, something has gone wrong. If you walk into a, if your comp, if you walk into your company, and you say, oh, this is how I would, dis I can't think of how I've described this culture, or it doesn't feel any different from any other place or whatever, then it's not working, right? Because the companies that I've gone to that have, that, that I've invested in that have been the most successful, when you walk into them, they have a very particular feel. They have a, you, when you meet someone, you go, oh, this person would be great for. Bill.com because I know that this person is like that group of people or whatever. Um, you know, it's a little bit. I've got, been going through the the, uh, the college process. My oldest is going off to college next year. I have a junior. So you go and you visit all these colleges, and you find out that they feel different. It turns out that they describe themselves differently. They feel different. You talk to the students; they're different. And you say, "Oh, my kid is a good fit for this one, or not?" Right? And the same is true of company culture. And so. You know, when you're interviewing people, you should have a clear sense of set, a clear sense of your company and what you're trying to build, and then you can say, "Oh, this person is a good is a good fit for for what we're trying to do." And truthfully, that there isn't a culture that's a good culture, right? I had there are, are hyper aggressive cultures that have been wonderfully successful. You know, there are very laid back, thoughtful cultures that have been successful. They're all you know, there's everything in between. So it's not like there's a way of a culture to build, but when you decide what you're building and what it feels like and the kinds of people, then then be true to your culture, be true to yourself, build, you know, hire those people. Because you know, if you have a culture that is um, that's very salesy and then you hire someone who is, you know, who is not who is not that, is much more uh, you know, kind of laid back and technical and whatever else. They won't fit in, and the people will be, and, and vice versa, right? So um, the other thing I'd say about people, and you learn this when you're trying to hire heads of sales, because it turns out that VPs of sales, even mediocre VPs of sales are good interviewers. That's their <laughs> job. They can, they can interview the shit out, you know? And so when you're talking to VPs, of sales, you have to figure out like what's the how am I going to get to the question of are you actually good at what you do or are you just really good at telling me you're good at what you do? And Sorry, David, we've got a ten minutes. Now. All right. So excellent. if everyone wants to mob in, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because you can't do it after ten o'clock. Yeah, I'm sorry no. to interrupt. But no, that's have, perfect. Our gong didn't go off. Okay. No, that's great. That's great. So, so from a uh, you know, so from from a hiring standpoint, there's. The best thing to do, and this is true of venture investing, and this is true of hiring people, this is true of when you, when you go out and raise money, I always say the same thing, which is, it's not a one-way thing. You should do the work to find out who's coming on your board, because at the end of the day, if it goes well, I've been on the Splunk board now for nine years. Renee Lassert, the founder of Bill.com, was the founder of PayCycle. I funded PayCycle in 2001 or two which means Renee and I have now been together for 11 years. I've, I've just had my 19th anniversary with my wife and my 11th anniversary with Renee Lazar. <laughs> you know, and, and that ratio is going to keep getting smaller. Right? You know, that's, that's Renee and I continue to, uh, you know, to be in love. So, so the best thing you can do by, by, without a question is talk to people who work with them. Talk to, and ideally people you know who've worked with them in the past and find out what people are like and find out how they behave and find out how they'll behave in circumstances that, uh, that you will likely encounter. Because there's no better understanding of how people will behave than how they've behaved in the past. It's not like they can't change a little, but they won't change a lot. Um, so anyway, and, and, and this all applies to bringing in a new CEO. I mean, success, it is, when it has worked in, in, in instances where I've had entrepreneurs say, I think we, I'm ready to be the CTO and bring in a CEO, or we, we need someone who can drive it to the next level. When we bring in someone who's consistent, has a consistent view of the company and of the culture, and isn't, you know, isn't there to create dramatic change, is there to try and make things better in incremental ways, then it succeeds. When, when there's that, you can't jumpstart a culture. 
You can't jumpstart a company. Even if it seems like it's not working, bringing out that person who's wildly different and thinking it's gonna change is a catastrophe. So, um, new CEOs and uh, So I guess the last question, so, so um, I haven't really talked about relay rides of the future of TV or data privacy or whatever. Uh, I'm wondering if those are too specific or if that's, uh, or, or if, you know, now, now having gone on about the venture business for uh, for 20 minutes, people are like, what I really wanted to know was, the future of is there something, is the future of TV? Is there not, no future. Anyone, and, is it, yeah. So, in, a, in an environment where who you know makes a lot of difference because they can make introductions, when you talk to companies that are not ready for August Capital or right for August Capital, do you do them a solid and, and make introductions? Well, it's really, it, it's really hard to do, but not impossible, right? There are times when that'll happen, but when you consider that in any given year, I have a thousand companies that come to me saying, I'm interested in, I'm interested in raising money from you, and I fund two of them. Right. The likelihood that I can engage with 998 in some meaningful way or whatever is very small, right? And so, um, so what I would say is that the venture investor is not the best person to do that for you, right? I'm, I, I continue to get emails into my inbox that are not introductions, and I continue to say the same thing every time. I'll still read. I still read these plans, but the reality is that. Over my 13 years in the venture business, I have never funded anyone who I didn't know or who wasn't introduced to me by someone I know. That, and again, like I repeat, I, I read everything that comes to my inbox, right? And I think you, and I don't think that it's the case that that will never happen, but the fact that over, if it's true that it's been a thousand companies a year, that over 13,000 companies have come to me and the ones that I've funded have been the from people I knew or the things I already, people I already knew, it suggests that you need to get introduced to venture investors. And I am not unique. In fact, there are, in, there are investors who won't even bother. You know, they don't, they won't read those emails and, and they would say to me, David, you're wasting your time because the companies that are interesting are the ones that are coming through some other connection, right? So <coughs> those same connections who are gonna introduce you are the same people who should help drive your business when you get no's. They're the same people who say, that's interesting, what is the feedback you gathered from, you know, from David and other venture investors that says, oh, what we have is not a coherent you know, product strategy, or we really need to demonstrate that we have traction with a couple of resellers, or whatever it is, take that feedback and use your internal network to build the business, because it will make your business, you know, it will make you stronger. It will make the business stronger, it will make the pitch stronger. I have three minutes, it looked like that was three. <laughs> Any last things before I talk about vacation or relay rides? By the way, relay rides is great. So the short answer, the short answer on relay rides is that this idea of collaborative consumption is very real, it's very important, and there will be a few very big companies that emerge from it. And then a, a lot of very small companies that emerge from it. But there are a few huge markets. <laughs> Hotels, there isn't any question, is a massive market. Airbnb is building a gigantic business. Uh, I, I believe they will likely continue to build a gigantic business. Run, car rental, right? I mean, the biggest expense in car rental is having a fleet of cars. Well, relay rides is eliminating that cost. Suddenly, you can list your car, you can get paid for your, someone using your car, and, and relay rides doesn't have to have a giant fleet of cars. More importantly, if you're someone who otherwise couldn't afford to buy a car because it's this fixed asset that you want on the weekends but you have no use for on the week, if you can suddenly <coughs> leverage it during the week to pay for it on the weekend, then you can have a car. I heard, I heard on the radio today, uh, yesterday, about a, a, a boat sharing company, I forget what it's called. Same thing, like no one in their right mind should ever buy a boat. <laughs> boats are, that is just, boats and RVs are for dupes. Don't buy a boat, don't buy an RV. That is just dumb. Or for people who are so rich that they're stupid. Those are your two choices, right? <laughs> Otherwise, fine, if you buy it now and you can have this collaborative economy, then you could make it available to others and suddenly you're not as stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'd all like to know, you mentioned introductions. I wonder 
you're in the business of doing blogs, communicating. Is there yeah. a place that we would read to learn who's likely or to pick up on the gospel of who introduces who? Well, the answer is everyone. Like the entirety of Silicon Valley is about introductions. The entirety of Silicon Valley, you know, um, is about people who genuinely want to be helpful, but have a constrained amount of time with with which they can be helpful, right? And so, so essentially everyone, not just in this room, but any, anyone who's coming here today to, to spend time with you is part of this, this economy of, uh, of relationships and, and all of that. And, um, and so in the end, people want, to, they, people want to support those people that they like and they're excited about what they're doing. And the best thing you can do is convince people you're doing exciting things, right? I help all sorts of people, and I help them for all sorts of reasons, right? And so sometimes, what I, the advice I give people is like, find the relationship or the connection. If you grew up in Hollis, New Hampshire, and you email me and say, I want to get together, I'm going to get together with you. Now, there's a reason for that. There are 5,800 people in Hollis, New Hampshire. I, you know, I was one of them, so now we're up to 57,999 left. My mother and father were one of them. We can start a living, right? I mean, you know, but what about your alumni associations, or if you're from a company, and, you know, it's, there are always relationships, your neighborhood, your whatever, where you can engage in that conversation, start the discussion, and get someone excited. But you need to get them excited. They need to, they need to, they need to want to be engaged and involved, and if they are, then they'll be helpful. And if they aren't, they, you know, they won't. And, um, with some reluctance, I'll mention this book only because the first chapter mentions me fairly heavily. Uh, <laughs> so it's completely shamelessly self-promoting. But there's a great, uh, a great professor named Adam Grant uh, out of Wharton who wrote a book called Give and Take. And Give and Take is this idea of um, our, you know, people are either givers, they're people who are trying to help people and they think that they will in the, lo in the long run get value, and takers, people who are like, hey, how can you help me? Right? How can you, what can you do for me? And then there are people called matchers who go, hey, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you, right? And, and I think Silicon Valley is, large, thanks, is largely dominated by people who are givers, who understand that they're trying to make a bigger pop, that, they're tr that Silicon Valley as a whole can be bigger, that every company can get bigger, that every person's you know, life can get bigger, and that it's about helping people, but it's about helping people you like and people you've, you feel, you know, that you'll feel good when the company does better, when the person does better. And so finding those people and making those connections will be invaluable.